ladies and gentlemen, Professor Leonard Nydorf. Hello, thank you for having me here today. It's really a pleasure. I think we all have uh, had an am amazing experience listening to Tom speak. In response to Tom's wide ranging presentation on J.R.R. Tolkien, I would like to consider the possible influence of Tolkien's academic work on Shippey's academic work. The idea that will be explored in this brief discussion is that in the realm of scholarship, we can perceive Shippey as an intellectual heir to Tolkien, one who developed and extended some of his most fundamental arguments and insights. Tolkien's most significant contribution to scholarship is an essay entitled Beowulf, The Monsters and the Critics which he delivered to the British Academy in 1936. This lecture revolutionized the study of Beowulf. Tolkien inspired generations of readers to regard the poem not as a historical document devoid of aesthetic value, but as the first great poem in the English language, a masterpiece comparable to the works of Virgil or Milton. Yet there is more to Tolkien's essay than a defense of the aesthetic value of Beowulf. More fundamentally, Tolkien mounts an argument against ethnocentrism and anachronism, and he exhorts students of literature to be on their guard against these ever-threatening phenomena. For instance, towards the beginning of the, his essay, Tolkien writes, Nearly all the censure and most of the praise that has been bestowed on the Beowulf has been due either to the belief that it was something that it was not, for example, primitive, pagan, Teutonic, an allegory, political or mythical, or most often an epic, or to disappointment at the discovery that it was itself and not something that the scholar would have liked better. For example, a heathen heroic lay, a history of Sweden, a manual of Germanic antiquities, or a Nordic summa theologica. Tolkien is here essentially chastising modern readers who turn to medieval literature not to find medieval literature, but to find themselves, to find something that suits their interests, something that would be politically or professionally expedient to them. Tolkien exhorts his audience to try to read Beowulf on its own terms and to resist the temptation to view it in terms of literary forms that are more familiar. He writes, quote, we must dismiss, of course, from mind the notion that Beowulf is a narrative poem, that it tells a tale or intends to tell a tale sequentially. It is essentially a balance, an opposition of ends and beginnings. In its simplest terms, it is a contrasted description of two moments in a great life, rising and setting, an elaboration of the ancient and intensely moving contrast between youth and age, first achievement and final death. By jettisoning much of the critical baggage of his time, Tolkien was able to arrive at a description of the structure of Beowulf and an appreciation of the poem's qualities that surpassed much of what had been written by his predecessors. Tolkien goes on to claim that, quote, Beowulf is not an epic, not even a magnified lay. No terms borrowed from Greek or other literatures exactly fit. There is no reason why they should. Here, I think we get to the heart of the methodological and epistemological substance of Tolkien's argument. 
If Beowulf is judged according to the standards of the classical epic or the modern novel or some other literary form from which it is notably distant, then Beowulf will of course be found wanting. Instead of denigrating Beowulf from differing from other canonical works, Tolkien argues, we might admire the poem for the distinct form of beauty and charm it possesses. Thirty-six years after Tolkien delivered The Monsters and the Critics, a 29-year-old Tom Shippey published his first monograph, which was simply and modestly entitled Old English Verse. Judged from its cover, the book might look like another innocent and anodyne work of literary history, a summary or overview of the corpus of Old English poetry. Readers of the book, then and now, might be surprised to discover that it is actually a dense, sophisticated, and sardonic book, brimming with insights that remain to be fully developed. Its author was evidently a confident young man who reserved piety only for predecessors who deserved it. In the introduction to Old English Verse, Shippey takes aim at the work of W.K. Wimsett, a prominent literary theorist of the mid-20th century and a representative figurehead of the new critical movement. Shippey cites a passage from his book, The Verbal Icon, in which Wimsett comments on a description of a boat in Beowulf, and Wimsett writes of the poet, quote, he was delighted with the boat. He was eager to tell about it, as much about it as possible, while telling what it did. In addition to pointing out the rather obvious vapidity of Wimsett's remarks, Shippey observes that they are more fundamentally difficult to credit because the passage in question, the description of a boat, is a formulaic one, which is repeated elsewhere in Beowulf in a nearly verbatim manner. Thus, Shippey writes in response to Wimsett, quote, so the attempt at explanation fails, and the failure is caused by the assumption that archaic writers set themselves to keep the bargain of modern poetry that nothing vital will be left out and nothing unnecessary put in, that every word counts. But in Old English, they do not. If then successful poetry can be written against the grain of general modern acceptance, it would seem essential for every student of poetry to know about it and about the way it works. The death of Old English poetry, therefore, has one positive value as well, no doubt, as inescapable drawbacks. Since it means that our modern tradition is totally alien to it, in learning Old English, one gains not just some modifications of insight, but a second eye and a discovery of perspective. What one discovers when reading Old English poetry, Shippey goes on to argue, is a literature that operates on completely different terms from modern novels and poems. A literature we must struggle to understand, but which gains aesthetic and historical value from that act of intellectual struggle. In 1978, Shippey published another monograph with a modest and unassuming even unpromising title, Beowulf, which appeared in the series called Arnold's Studies in English Literature. Again, readers expecting an uncritical summary would find themselves surprised and disappointed. The first sentence of the book indicates its tenor. It begins, quote, criticism of Beowulf began in falsity and bias. 
Now, instead of regarding falsity and bias as phenomena confined to the first readers of Beowulf in the 18th and 19th centuries, Shippey demonstrates that these phenomena continue to affect our perception of Beowulf, albeit in different ways. He notes, for instance, that today, quote, it is axiomatic that violence breeds violence and violence never solves anything. The story of Beowulf, though, rests on three sudden applications of force, which are largely successful. Insofar as they are not, moreover, one might conclude that the weakness stems from an insufficiency of violence rather than an excess of it. If Beowulf had been stronger and better supported, he might even have survived the dragon. After demonstrating that drinking and boasting are also regarded in an ostensibly neutral or positive manner in Beowulf, Shippey argues for an un perspective on the poem and contends, quote, it is better to grasp the nettle at once and admit that, as with drink and boasting, violence played a different part in the poet's culture from that which it does in ours. Shippey's first book on Beowulf and much of the work that followed it thus appears to represent the most serious extension and development of Tolkien's argument against ethnocentrism and anachronism in literary study. Of course, it is impossible to ward off such phenomena completely, but Shippey's work shows what is to be gained by making the effort to discard preconceptions and approach Beowulf on its own terms. Instead of finding ourselves in the poem, we can find something different there. And that is really much more interesting. Tolkien and Shippey can be viewed then as polemical writers at odds with their contemporaries, somewhat alienated from the prevailing institutions of their times. It is always beneficial to the careerist and to the conformist, of course, to be ethnocentric and anachronistic, to find in medieval literature whatever one gets rewarded for finding there. Yet Tolkien and Shippey resist that temptation. They also show a contrarian impulse in their willingness, their very salient willingness to question, quote, correct and sober taste. In The Monsters and the Critics, Tolkien defends the Beowulf poet's decision to focus his poem on a hero's fight against monsters instead of human adversaries. Tolkien writes, quote, Correct and sober taste may refuse to admit that there can be an interest for us, the proud we that includes all intelligent living people, in ogres and dragons. We then perceive its puzzlement in face of the odd fact that it has derived great pleasure from a poem that is actually about these unfashionable creatures. Lurking behind Tolkien's words is an argument for the aesthetic value and intellectual seriousness of fantasy literature. His contemporaries repeatedly expressed a wish that Beowulf were more like other epic poems, which told of tragic conflicts between humans and did not focus on monsters. Dissenting from them, Tolkien argued that the focus on monsters in Beowulf was one of the poem's strengths, not its fatal weakness. Shippey has, of course, been the great inheritor of Tolkien in this regard. For 50 years, he has taken every opportunity to question the received canons of good taste and ask why science fiction and fantasy literature are considered less meritorious than traditionally canonical works of literature. 
Readers of The Road to Middle-Earth and J.R.R. Tolkien, author of the century, will understand what I am talking about. Shippey has been the greatest champion of those authors who have been disdained by critics but beloved by readers, the most notable of whom is, of course, none other than J.R.R. Tolkien. Thank you. And um, you, can, you can go to the next slide. Uh, this is just a slide to highlight uh, Tolkien translated Beowulf and put out a translation and commentary. Tom and I have also followed in Tolkien's footsteps and put out a translation of commentary translated by Tom, commented on by me uh, with a number of supplementary materials. And um, if you'd like more information about the book, there's a next slide. You can uh, go on your social media and look for at Uppsala Books on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, and you can learn more about this book and about other books forthcoming from Uppsala Books. So thank you all and look forward to questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Nydor. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and please follow our pages on Twitter and Instagram under the name at Uppsala Books.